Adam Tews, economic historian. So glad that you're joining me on uh, G Zero World. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. So uh, last time we spoke, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, you said that it wouldn't be implausible if by the end of 2021, U.S. unemployment could be close to 20%, certainly in the teens. You know, to come down from the numbers that we're headed towards this summer, it wouldn't be implausible that you would be in the teens 18 months out from now. No, on the contrary, in fact, I mean, given how high we're likely to go, you know, a number around 20% is altogether possible at this point. That is not where we are right now. Now, I am not orienting this interview to do gotcha politics with Adam Tews, but I do want to ask why you think the recovery has been so much more robust than you might have expected. No, I mean, it's a fair question. I mean, I think the last time we spoke, we were really in the middle of the economic meltdown um, spring, early summer of last year. And I don't think any of us uh, anticipated in our lifetime seeing the kind of headlines that we were seeing out of the American labor market um, that, at that time. I mean, the, you know, those Thursday morning, 8.30 a.m. releases of the numbers of Americans signing up for unemployment benefit were harrowing. They were, they were extraordinarily stressful, even for somebody who has secure employment and is just worried about the state of the world. I think there was a state of panic um, at that moment. And I think it was well merited and well justified. And we know unemployment did indeed surge into the high teens and in many communities well above that. So there was good reason, I think, to be as concerned as we were. What I don't think we anticipated were basically two things. Um, the first is the vaccine. I mean, that's the turnaround event, right? It's the fact that we were able basically to get a grip on this disease in some of the advanced economies through the vaccine. And we simply didn't have any reason to expect a vaccine to be as effective as it is and to come as quickly as it did. And the second thing, of course, is that we were still beginning to flex our muscles with regard to economic policy and the scale of fiscal and monetary stimulus that we've seen is as unprecedented as the shock of the spring of last year. So we have seen a remarkable countervailing force put in play um, on a scale that I, again, I mean, I'm a historian of 2008. Um, and nevertheless, it took me, as it did other people, by surprise how large the fiscal and monetary mass was that was mobilized across the world um, to prevent the worst. Yes, across the world, indeed. And I mean, certainly not in any way coordinated, but nonetheless felt like everyone was reading from the same playbook, both from a fiscal and a monetary perspective. Do you think, I mean, were lessons learned from 2008 that carry over constructively? for the ministers of finance, the secretary of treasury, the central bank heads today? Absolutely there were. I think, you know, when we learn from history, we should recognize the fact, you know, it's the, the cliche is of course you can't, and it's always even dangerous to do so. But I think in this case, we can say that lessons were learned. Um, and, you know, it's in fact, some of the key staff at the central banks are veterans of 2008. So when the order comes to buy assets, to do QE, they really know how to do it. And they do it on a scale which is a literally an order of magnitude, you know, 10x larger than uh, what we saw in 2008. Um, there was coordination in the, in the way it works in the global monetary system, which is it doesn't have to be a sit down meeting of the G20 finance ministers. What you need is for the Fed to lead. And if the Fed leads, it signals to the markets and by way of the markets to even emerging market central banks, that it's OK, despite the hemorrhage of foreign capital that was happening last year, to lower your interest rates. I mean, a, a combination we never thought we'd see, that you know, Indonesia would be cutting its interest rate um, in the face of a loss of foreign capital. Indonesia being at the heart of the Asian financial crisis of the late 1990s, suffering a huge legitimacy hit, regime change, fully able to ride out the storm. And that is enabled by the Fed's actions more locally in the United States. I mean, the learning on the part of the leadership of the Democratic Party is, is palpable. It's manifest. I mean, they are trying not to repeat some of the mistakes they, in retrospect, accused themselves of having made in 2009. They, they went too small. They didn't go big enough in that first, the only stimulus the Obama administration got to fire off. And they also went for industry. They went for the banks. They went for the automotive companies. They did not go for the social contract. They didn't go for the average American worker. Occupy Wall Street 
notwithstanding. Is that also a lesson that is being learned today in the United States? Well, I think there's two phases to this. The CARES Act was a bodged together compromise and a lot of very affluent Americans got a lot of money out of that. But the really telling moment is the uh, the rescue plan the Biden administration launched in its first stimulus. And that was very targeted money. That went to middle America, it went to working class Americans, it went to those who needed it most. And that is clearly a lesson learned, reinforced by, incorporated by the Democratic Party, driven by the voices of the left. I mean, this is learning, in a sense, by struggle, where the Sanders campaign and uh, AOC um, in the Senate and the House, respectively, genuinely have exercised leverage over policy thinking. From a political dysfunctionality perspective, the United States isn't offering many lessons these days. But economically, when you look at the latest numbers coming out from the World Bank, the U.S. 2020-21 looks a hell of a lot more robust and resilient than the EU or the UK or, of course, Japan or Canada. I mean, you're the economist here. Tell us, you know, where you think the league tables look right now and why. It's important not to confuse growth rates with levels here. So it is true that the US economy is bouncing back at a remarkable rate. What we're doing, though, is achieving the, you know, the, the not slight achievement of returning to the trend we were on before even going slightly above it. So uh, the United States is now growing back towards uh, the trend level that you would have expected before 2019. That is the achievement of economic policy in the US right now, not to have permanently slumped below that trend which is what we saw after 2008-9. Compared to the Europeans, this is a remarkable achievement. Europe is not expected to attain its pre-2020 level of GDP, let alone the trend of, as it were, it hypothetically should have been until the end of this year or beginning of, of next. It has not fundamentally changed the balance in the sense that China rebounded much more rapidly and using the familiar formula of heavy industrial investment is powering ahead. So the gap between China and the United States, despite America's impressive growth rates right now, will continue to widen because China is not just clawing its way back to where it should have been. It's actually powering ahead on that growth trend um, to levels we've not seen before. You know, the, the worries about China's growth are, of course, real and will continue to be real. And they did go back to the old playbook of, of heavy investment. And we're seeing that in their demand for iron ore, in their demand for steel, for coal right now. Um, but that is, I think, the, the fundamental continuity where the real hit is going to come, the world changing hit, is in the situation of the emerging markets and particularly Latin America, because the emerging markets came through 2008-9 relatively well. Latin America leading that charge because it was a commodity driven boom with China sustaining their growth. Latin America right now, still in the midst of a terrible pandemic there, um, is looking at a lost decade. It does feel while the United States is now powering ahead, that the developing world is, is further and further behind, not the globalization story that we were hoping for. I think that's right. And as far as the US is concerned, you would hope that all eyes really are on the, on the, the rest of the Western Hemisphere. This has got to be a matter, I would say, of absolutely urgent concern in Washington. Uh, Mexico, I mean, our immediate neighbor, um, coming through the crisis, very hard hit. In fact, one of the big beneficiaries of America's stimulus is Mexico's export sector. But the Mexican economy per se has taken a huge hit. And the other, of course, giant piece of the Latin American puzzle is Brazil, where the, the crisis has been profound. Um, and how in the hugely polarized politics of Brazil, you know, Bolsonaro's future plays out against an increasingly worrying, I think one has to say, financial backdrop. Brazil, one of the players who in 2020 did a big fiscal action on the scale of an advanced economy, 10% of GDP roughly, also quite progressive as a result of pressure from Congress in Brazil, trickling down, spending down very substantial amounts of cash to the tens of millions of people who scrape by. Um, how any of that can be continued into 21 and 22 should really, I think, be a a fundamental concern of American policy. That's the crisis that's closest to home for the US. I mean, these are countries that don't have anywhere near the level of vaccine access. They don't have anywhere near the level of capability of funding continued shutdowns and disruptions to their economy. Uh, I mean, if you want to play that out, I mean, Africa would seem to be where you'd have an even bigger problem from that 
perspective. What is the mechanism that you see out there over the coming years? If Latin America is losing a decade, how does it get addressed? What happens? I mean, this is not just a job for the IMF. Well, this, I think, is the challenge which the G7 began to lay out with uh, what they call the B3W, Build Back Better World campaign, which is supposed to be the West's answer, Japan, Europe, United States answer to One Belt, One Road. And that is where a policy should be, I think one should say squarely. Whether or not there will be a policy there um, is really the, the, the big question of the moment and whether it will be scaled uh, to the adequate scale. You know, to be in this game seriously, you need to be talking trillions of dollars. I mean, that has seemed like crazy numbers. But if you think about the development needs with the extraordinary demographic surge running through sub-Saharan Africa now, or you think about the development needs of the poor parts of Latin America, those are just, that's, that's you know, the opening bid to get seriously in this game. And the question is how that kind of funding is mobilized. The talk, of course, immediately then turns to financial engineering, various types of complex leverage mechanism where maybe a couple of hundred million dollars from the Europeans, the Japanese and the Americans leverage out to be trillions of dollars from the private sector. But that agenda has been on the books since 2015. This is the billions into trillions agenda of the World Bank. It has not gathered the momentum that we would expect and we urgently need. And we are still a long way away from, I think, in the West being ready to to really mobilize to the scale that will be that will be necessary to address those problems. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. I mean, given how limited COVAX has been on the vaccine front, which would be a comparatively small amount of money that would unlock far greater um, investment and growth. Um, you know, if you can't do that, if you can't begin to do that in a significant way for these countries, it's hard to get very excited about the broader and more and, and much larger needs long term for infrastructure. I mean, it's one of the fundamental puzzles, I think, for a political scientist like yourself or an economically minded historian like me. I mean, we have certain basic premises like, you know, that the dollar bills aren't left lying around on the street. Right. That, that just shouldn't happen. And yet everything tells us. Indeed, the major financial authorities, the IMF, the World Bank, tell us that there are trillions of dollars lying around in the street. Lying on the street. In the form of the option of a joint, sustained, truly globally orientated vaccine campaign. If we put tens of billions in, we would achieve benefits running into potentially the tens of trillions. And frankly, any member of the G20, with the possible exception of South Africa, could fund this domestically and it would be a worthwhile investment. Think of the political payoff if Germany had taken the lead. I don't, know about, I don't know about Argentina, Adam. I mean, okay, I don't fine. Know, so man. let's take Argentina and South Africa <laughs> off. But the, the large, credible members yeah. of the G20, you know, if you come in with a bid, an opening bid of saying, no, we're not coming with, you know, 500 million euros. We're coming with 20 billion because we actually want this problem because we're Germany and we're an export dependent economy and we need this to go quickly. Right. And why those kind of bids have not piled in and instead we're, you know, uh, piecing, puzzling together as they did at the G7 in Cornwall, you know, the necessary one billion doses so as to be able to announce those kind of figures. It's, it's a failure of political imagination. So much discussion now about recent inflation numbers, particularly in the United States, higher than people expected. Larry Summers, of course, you know, uh, raised alarms on this early and was pushed back really hard uh, by the Biden administration. Most economists, you're an economist. What do you think? I think we shouldn't exaggerate our fears around this. I mean, the bounce back in prices is real. There are a variety of different effects, some of them statistical. If prices went down last year, they're bound to go up this year by larger percentage points. There are real shortages. If you've tried to build a house or do any repairs this year, you'll know that lumber was literally just short. You couldn't get it. But I think most people agree that these are transient effects. And when I say most people, I mean the best informed decision makers in central banks globally, both on both sides of the Atlantic, and also the markets have stuck with the Fed in its assessment that this is transient. And we again should just have a sort of check on ourselves, like why are we panicking? And what does that panic relate to? And to my mind, it still is a sort of undigested legacy of the trauma of the 1970s. That's the last time there was any inflation in Western Europe and in the United States. And, you know, if we're still, as it were, working off the hangover from 50 years ago, I think, I think we do need to update our priors. We need to update our economic vision. The problem, and it remains the problem, is in fact deflation, lowflation, 
the fact that we aren't able to push long run inflation expectations well above 2% and why that matters, we'll just look at our debt pile. I mean, if you've got the kind of debt pile that we have, historically speaking, the gentle way to deal with that is, you know, is have inflation just a little bit higher than interest rates and bite away at it year by year. That's how Britain and America did it after World War Two. That's the comfortable way to work your way out from underneath a debt mountain. So as an economic historian and one of the world's preeminent uh, in your field, uh, having now gone through almost a couple of years of pandemic, what do you think is the biggest lesson? longer term lesson that you've learned as we've as we've experienced all of this that we need to take the cassandra seriously right looking back on this um the emerging infectious power uh, diseases paradigm the emerging infectious diseases paradigm so called uh, appeared in the 1980s it ran in parallel with the climate change diagnosis both of these were predicted to be the consequence of modernity of globalization and we did not take that risk seriously enough. And we are, in a sense, I think, still not taking it seriously enough in believing that we're done with this crisis or that it's over and that therefore, you know, the world doesn't fundamentally change and we grow back to where we were before. Surely what's happened is a window has opened for us on huge risks which are inherent to the system from which we prosper, from which we benefit, to which we are committed to irrevocably, I, I take it. Um, that we will have to manage in future. And those risks are not slow moving, not gradual, not, ma- not measured in a percentage point of GDP here or there, or in a thousand lives, 10,000 lives here or there. They're measured in millions of lives and 20% of GDP loss occurring in a matter of weeks and months, right? That's the sort of scale. It's not trench warfare, it turns out, it's blitzkrieg. It's something that comes at you with lightning speed. And if you do not have the capacity to react quickly, you can be looking at the largest economic disaster in recorded history. That's, I think, for me, the lesson of 2020. I mean, it's sort of appalling to digest it, but we at least do have a clear indication of one of the minimal things that we need to provide ourselves with insurance, which is a huge science apparatus. I mean, we're obviously terrible at the socio-political economic digesting of this. We've got some welfare state apparatuses that work not so badly, and the central banks do their job. But to address this problem, we're really, you know, hopelessly under-equipped. But we do have a magic wand. We do have a silver bullet. And we should be doubling down on that. I mean, technology, if it is, it's perhaps not, as it were, the most holistic answer. But if it's an answer, and it's our strong card, we really should be doubling down on it. I think that's the same basic approach also to climate change. Given the likelihood that we are not going to be able to address it in a holistic fashion, you would think that we would be making enormously larger investments in, in technologies in that area.